So it's really a pleasure to meet everyone here, and uh, we have something exciting to share with you. Um, so first of all, we want to share with you what we are, what the idea of this uh, project is about. And it's not really a something that's a, you know, set in stone, it's really a methodology. And um, it's something, hopefully some inspiration for your projects, for your methodology to develop. <clears throat> so we really want to have the accountability in a software ecosystem that will tell people how much energy you use in your software, software and hardware information system and how can you make uh, um, adjustments to your workloads, to your infrastructure, and to your administration. We present the problems and present also um, give you some solutions that we hope can give you ideas for your future uh, <coughs> experimentation. The architecture is really based on the CNCF ecosystem. Although this uh, capital is not in CNCF yet, we hope this is will get you to the way uh, very soon. Uh, you use a number of uh, technologies, Rook as the base of this, fund, uh, as this uh, solution, with some other te technologies. Uh, and we will briefly talk about Kepler. Uh, Kepler is uh, the project we gave you as the keynote. It's meant to be help you to manage the software uh, workload level energy consumption. We present to you the analytics that will correlate with the workload tracing and energy reporting from Kepler to figure out how to identify your API level energy consumption. Uh, you will we'll give you a demo and we will give you some of the ideas what we plan to do in the future. So if you are looking at the big picture, uh, the energy consumption as in general has been uh, tremendous. The number itself may not make a lot of sense if you are just reading them right now. But you can see that ICT in general using anywhere between 1% to 10% data center and ICT, anywhere between 1% to 10% of the total electricity consumed around the globe. And if you are looking at the recent trends, that picture could be even bigger in the future as well. But in my opinion, there's going to be two things that's making the growth higher. One is that's, uh, the wireless network, the 5G. Uh, and, you know, even though 5G has been rolling over the years, but if you're looking at the, the, over the last part the generation, 5G over 4G, the 5G is three times denser and three times more power uh, expensive than 4G, each of the device. So in total, that's 10 times more energy used in 5G than 4G. The other one is the AI and uh, the Bitcoin and uh, crypto, cryptocurrency. Um, AI has been known for a long time, but most recently, if you are looking at how ChatGPT is uh, changing the dynamics, even search engines like in Google and Microsoft is going to integrate uh, ChatGPT-like uh, work, uh, uh, workloads. So according to a certain benchmark, if you are integrating AI into the search engine, uh, the workloads we are using five times as much compute as single search. So that well, means a lot of explosion in energy consumption in the near and long-term future. So if you are not doing anything right now, then that's going to be a catastrophic future that we are going to face. And if you are putting the numbers in perspective, our industry, in just in data center industry, is comparable, the carbon footprint is comparable than the airline in general. And airline, imagine that is how big the, uh, the flights have to go around the world and how frequently you have to use it. But if, if you're putting the carbon footprints together, they're comparable and our industry is actually growing much faster. So that really gives us a huge urgency to take actions right now. And how we're going to do that? Our belief is that accountability is going to be the driving force to make the energy efficiency in the future. If we are not taking into accountability, if you do not know the metrics, if you do not, based on these metrics, take actions, then nothing will happen in the first place. If you just say, I'm a green data center, by what metrics do you mean is green? If you say, I'm a green software infrastructure, by what means? And how do you mean uh, to be green in practice? So we want to bring some of the uh, metrics some of the measurements into place. And I, we want to put in, break down the workloads at different levels so, such that when you see your workloads, when you see the API you consume, you will have some ideas how much energy, how much carbon the API and the software is associated with. So that is something we hopefully can provide you uh, some of inspirations from this uh, presentation. Um, so the problems 
we identified uh, consists of the three of them. One of us, what base level, how do you identify the workload energy consumption? And how do you correlate the workload energy consumption with carbon? So that's the sort of fundamental questions we want to ask in the project's Kepler. So as we are said in the keynotes, Kepler is a software power meter. It's using a number of technologies, including machine learning and eBPF, to help you, and the end user, as well as the software developers, to uh, get the idea of how much energy the software or the workloads uses on your runtime system. It's that so by a certain open public methodology that has been used in the research community for many years. The second one is um, for your operation, how can you switch end to end? We use S3 in this example. Um, this is a very popular API and everybody uses. So by using this API, we hopefully can give you some ideas. If you are using your own API, how do you do the tracing? So s 3 API um, does consist of lots of entities. Uh, so we using Rook in this solution to help you to switch from, end to, from the uh, ingestion of the API to the processing and to the um, final destination, how much or well the uh, API will traverse. And using that data tra uh, tracing, we are correlated as a login message with Kepler's uh, power message to get ideas of for API level, how much energy used by the service. Thank you. Okay, so now we know what we want to achieve, we know what our goals are, and we'll have to take a little bit, uh, a small look at how we achieve that, what kind of technologies we're having in our architecture. So, as Human said, our example is with um, uh, cloud storage, so we're using Rook to set up the, uh, the Ceph cluster. Um, and the other technologies we use is Kepler, as Human mentioned, this is what measures the energy consumption of the different pods in our system. And Open Telemetry and Jaeger, this, these are the technologies that we're using for the end-to-end -end tracing. Eventually everything funnels up to Prometheus, this is where we do the calculation and we show the outcomes. Now we're going to drill down a little bit into the different architectures. Um, so Rook and Ceph. As I said, Rook is the uh, Kubernetes operator to deploy Ceph. Ceph is an on-prem uh, uh, storage defined, um, uh, software defined storage solution, distributed storage solution. And we're gonna focus on, it has different APIs, uh, block and, and file. We're gonna uh, focus on the object API, which is S3 compatible. Um, so if you look at, at what's going on there, there is a Rook operator, it deploys the system, or it deploys the system, it deploys the front end, which is uh, the S3 interface, those are called the Redis gateways or the RGWs, and it deploys also the backends, uh, those are actually the drivers that take, take the data and writes them into disk, those are called the OSDs. So in such a system you would have multiple of the front ends and multiple of the backends, um, and um, uh, uh, in front of the front end, usually you have some kind of a load balancer. So when a user uh, uploads their data or downloads their data from the uh, from the storage system, they can pick any of the entry points, any of the RGWs. Uh, the same user can use. There's no affinity. Can use whatever RGW that they want, and the user writes the data to their bucket. This also is uh, most often sharded and written to multiple OSDs or to multiple disks. For of course for parallelism and performance. So if we look about the if we look at the logical entity which is the user, then it is pretty much all over the place. So the, the actual processes that take takes care of the user are many processes um, of many types, both the front end RGWs and the back end OSDs. The other system that we're using also a CNCF project is open telemetry in Jaeger. Um, so open telemetry is a framework for uh, for tracing and uh, in many cases it does instrumentation for the technologies um, our technology is done in uh, the the Ceph technology both the RGW and those and the OSD are written in C++ so we had to do the instrumentation ourselves not only that we also did the serialization and deserializations of the traces over our RADOS interface. This is what sends from the RGW to the OSD and eventually to the disk. So we'll get the end-to-end, -end, um, we'll end the end-to-end -end trace um, because we serialize the trace into the, our own messaging. Um, so um, the uh, Jaeger operator um, injects the uh, Jaeger agents into the pods um, as the sidecars, and uh, the OpenTelemetry SDK speaks to them. 
um, and they're sending uh, all the information. The Jaeger operator also creates the all-in-one uh, pod that we used in the demo, uh, which is a Jaeger pod, and the agents um, send the information into the, this, uh, the collector in the pod. There's also a query interface in the pod, there's also a UI. Uh, we're gonna use the query interface in the pod to fetch the information later on and do the processing uh, that would give us the results that we're looking for. Um, now for the next technology, which is Kepler, I'm gonna return that back to you. Thank you, Yuval. Uh, so Kepler is really based on a number of uh, uh, scientific research. Uh, we make uh, the technology, the research affordable in uh, software technologies so people can consume it very easily. So Kepler, as, uh, if you are looking at the layered model, uh, we collect the information using eBPF as the very bottom. So the information will consist of um, the software as the hardware level. So the hardware, we use the hardware counters, uh, including the CPU instruction, the CPU cycles, the cache misses, and potentially we're going to add more. So these are the information that's uh, in the scientific research has proofs to have strong correlation with the software activities that has been running in the system. With this information, we also collect the software information, um, including the software at the operating system level, the CPU runtime, uh, the CPU runtime, the memory usage, and things like that. Why do we need to have both hardware and software information? It's because we want to have our capital to be able to tell the energy used both by biometal bio environments as well as the virtual machine environments. When you are running on biometals, we're using the hardware counters to tell you how much energy you're using by the workloads. When you are running on virtual machines, as in most of the public clouds or private clouds, you do not have access to the hardware counters. Then we're usually using the software counters as and the different models to tell you how much energy you're using in your own environments. The nice thing is that uh, regardless of where your workload runs, you always have a model to match, and that model will just help you to identify the energy used by the workloads without a lot of you know, change of configurations or just change of the uh, settings in your workloads. Once we get this information, the next thing we do is to try to correlate how much energy, uh, this is the, you know, stats, uh, the metrics from the process or C group, and we find out the identity of the C groups in the user, place, uh, user space representation. In the user space, um, the, we do not, the user space use the, the SHA instead of the uh, int64 as in the kernel. So we'll find out sh that SHA, and then using that SHA in query the accumulates API, so we can cast the pod name, a container name, and the container namespace. And from that level, we can report everything that has, has happened to this container, to this pod. And then we create the, uh, the uh, Prometheus metrics to export the energy information associated with that process or containers or pod. So that is how things work uh, in this way. What is missing here is that the, the model, how the model is created. So. We create the model, uh, this is a little bit chicken, uh, chicken and egg. We need the model to tell the energy consumption by processes or by uh, containers. But so we create the model using the same metrics as we collect at the process level. But we aggregate everything at the server level or at the node level. And then from that node level information, we associate with the node level energy that's what you read from the CPU. So for x86, you have REPL, the runtime power level. On ARM, certain ARM um, implementation, you have hardware sensors to help you to uh, get the uh, energy information from the CPU package. And then we build out these models using linear regression for simplicity, because linear regression is not hard to train and very uh, efficient to calculate. We also support uh, nonlinear models, for example, neural network, as well as the machine learning models such as SGBoost, which will give us better accuracy. Uh, but so that's also come as an expense as the inference time, because it also takes a lot of CPU cycles to calculate. Uh, but we give these options anyway. So if you want to have a simple model, uh, low overhead, we're using linear. If you have, want to have a more accurate model, uh, but you can afford more CPU cycles using a nonlinear model. So that's opportunity. Uh, that's um, a choice is all totally up to you. So once this information gets uh, you know fit into the machine learning model trainer, we call it the Kepler model trainer. We can create the model, and that model is uh, uploaded to our GitHub, and we download from GitHub and packages in the Kepler container, and we use that model. Um, 
just to show you what we can uh, Kepler can do, uh, this is as already as the Prometheus uh, API. The this side of the <laughs> this side of the query is as a container level, as a namespace level. So we aggregate all the paths in that container and show and do the rates because Kepler uh, only collects the aggregates uh, energy in joules. So if you divide the time by time statement, that's the power in watts. So you see over time, the watts as different namespace is all more or less constant because we do not run a lot of workload at the moment. The highest one, uh, the purple one, I think that is a rook. And then uh, that is about 80 watts. And by the way, this is running on Minikube on virtual machine. So that's just to show that uh, we can run both in virtual machines as well as uh, bare metals, and you can easily replicate these environments in your home environments. On this side of the uh, the diagram, this is in the part. It's in the part. So if you look at the query on the top, that's we are just uh, look at the container namespace rook self. So in this namespace, we can break everything down as a part level. So you can see um, uh, which which part consumes more energy than the other. Um, I think that's a uh, I'm um, kind of colorblind at the moment, but I think the highest um, uh, energy consuming part is uh, 16 watts at the moment. And for that, I will um, show the best thing from Yuval. Thank you, Min. Okay, so now that we have all the mechanics in place, I'm going to show how we actually do the calculations. Uh, so on, on, on one side, you see the traces. So traces are consisted from multiple spans. Uh, spans are like units of work inside the trace, the end-to-end -end trace, um, and they have different attributes. So a span will have the pod that the unit of work was execu executed on, it will have the duration, and it can have tags. And that's really where the kind of special thing is happening because, um, for example, the entry point, the Redis gateway know, knows the user. The OSDs, whatever writes to the disk, doesn't have any idea of what a user or a bucket is. Uh, but we're going to stamp the, the span that knows the user with a tag that tells the user name. And uh, as, the, as the trace traverses the different processes and the different steps, then it will going to accumulate more spans, more information about the duration of the operation in each and every pod. And one of them or some of them will also have these extra tags that would allow us to later on correlate the whole thing. Um, this is really a simplified uh, vision of what a span is because span could have hierarchies. You can have a subspan, and then when you calculate the duration, you have to make sure at which level you calculate the duration because you don't want to count twice. Uh, but for just for simplicity, in those cases, like the spans come just one after the other. Um, so we're fetching all the spans from the uh, from the Jaeger query uh, interface, and then uh, we can create. Or we, we will group them by first by pod and user which means that for each user on each pod, we're going to count the duration of all the spans of this user. Uh, even span that doesn't know what the user is because the trace does know what the user is. So this is, this is how it works. So we do this initial group by, as I said, of pod and user. Then we also do another group by only of pod. And so you would know how much overall duration of all the traces of all the users of this pod uh, took. And from those two uh, tables, you can calculate the percentage of a user in a pod during, of course, the lifetime of the test that we're running. Um, so in these cases, we just uh, summarized that everything per pod and just did the simple division to get the percentage of each user uh, from the pod during the lifetime. Uh, this is the big table on the left. Now, from Kepler, we're getting a simpler table, just each pod, just like uh, the previous slide from Huamin. Uh, each pod has its uh, energy consumption during the period of the test. And we see that, that table on the upper right-hand side. And from these two tables, we can combine the information together. Now, how do we do that? So for each of the percentages that we calculated for the um, the user in a pod, we would go to the matching pod and took the energy and would assume that the proportion of the duration that of the traces and spans of the user in this pod matches more or less the proportion of energy that the user consumed. So we know the energy per pod, so what, now we can know the energy per user per pod. And if we not want to know the overall en energy of the user, we just summarize all the energy of this user across all the pods. So at the bottom right hand, you would see a table that gives you a user 
with their summaries and the overall energy that the user used. So that's how the math works, and this is why we need the end-to-end -end tracing, because without end-to-end -end tracing, we cannot do the group by by user because we don't have this information available in all of the processes. Uh, this might be a little, little difficult to ingest in, in a very short uh, amount of time. Uh, you're welcome to ask me questions later on, or I would recommend uh, just look at the Python code that does that. That would make that much simpler, I think. Uh, and now we're going to try a live demo. Yeah, sure. Thank you. OK. I think these are working. Is this working? Hello? Oh, I I OK. OK, so first let's see what's going on on the system that we're running. Uh, so those are the pods running there. You can see that the Kepler pod that does the uh, the calculation of the uh, of the energy. The whole bunch of Prometheus uh, pods that are doing the Prometheus stuff uh, in the in the monitoring namespace. You would see in the observability namespace there's the Jaeger operator, and that's what spins up the all-in-one pod of Jaeger, which is the second one. Um, you'd also see the, a whole bunch of uh, of Rook pods. So the important ones for us is that. The bottom one is the Ceph RGW. This is the entry point, the S3 uh, interface of Rook. And we have two OSDs, OSD1 and OSD0, that match the two disks that I have there on the system. Uh, so these are the pods that we're working on. The rest, of the, the rest of the pods is kind of overhead or idle time. And there was a great uh, talk yesterday about um, uh, doing um, optimization of energy on bare metal. And, one of the interesting things that they said there is that the, the idle time overhead is big, and we would see that here as well. <laughs> OK, so now we're going to run the demo. OK, so the first thing, I'm going to create three buckets. I was talking about users, but bucket and users in this case is pretty much the same. Each user has one bucket, just for the, my simplicity. I'm going to create all the files I'm going to upload ahead of time. The reason I'm doing that is two. First of all, uh, I don't want to measure the energy consumption of the creation of the file because this is like outside of the system. The second is I want to upload everything in parallel so I can load the system as much as I can uh, because if the system is lo not loaded, then it's all idle uh, overhead. Uh, the first thing I do, I fetch from Prometheus the Kepler counts. Uh, the reason I do that um, is because those are running counters, so I have to fetch them before the test. Now I'm actually doing the test. I'm uploading uh, the three, uh, the three uh, buckets. I have a light bucket, a medium bucket, and a heavy bucket. Um, and um, the object sizes are kind of random, and 10% uh, goes to the light bucket, 30% uh, goes to the medium bucket, um, and the remaining 60% goes to the uh, heavy bucket. Um, so I took a snapshot of the Kepler stats uh, from Prometheus. Now I'm running the test. It's running. And um, once it's done, I'll have to take another snapshot from, the, uh, uh, from, from Prometheus for the Kepler stats, so I'll do the diff. So I'll have the energy consumption during the test. And then I'll take that, take the traces, kind of calculate everything that I showed in the previous, um, in a previous slide in, in my Python code, and uh, see how much energy everything, anything uh, took. OK. Let's give it a couple more seconds. OK, so I fetched the, uh, uh, the Kepler stat from Prometheus. OK, I'm patching the traces. That might take a little longer. There are quite a bit of traces here. And I mean, we'll talk about it later, because there's also the question of how much energy the tracing and all that stuff is taking. And let's see what pans out. OK, so whatever it says internal, this is like overhead. Uh, you would see that the heavy bucket took about uh, 300 joule. Um, the bucket checker is, again, kind of overhead. This is something internal to Rook that kind of checks the health of the system. Uh, by the way, I'm running with Rook uh, 110. In Rook 111, they removed that, so saved on energy. You can take off 130 joule from, from there. Uh, the light bucket 
uh, take, uh, well, the smallest amount, and the minimum bucket takes something in the middle. You would see here that the bucket checker, which is just overhead, takes the same amount as the medium one, so it's good that they removed that. Um, and this is pretty much the, the output of, the, um, of our system and end of the demo. Uh, thank you, Yuval. Uh, so that's very uh, uh, straightforward way to visualize what is going on, and uh, this is a really a good PLC. So from there, uh, we can discuss a lot of potentials. First thing is um, you don't really want to turn on spacing in your production, right? So how and also uh, spacing has a lot of overhead. So in practice, I think it's uh, reasonable to think that um, you can take turn on some sampling from time to time, just give you some sense what is going on. So what we are going to do next is to use the sampling to build up the model. That's where we'll similar. Uh, that's where we'll, um, guess the. So we will build out two models. One is from the spacing. The other one is from uh, sampling. Think about non-edge distillation. So sampling will learn from the spacing the actual energy consumption, but with l much much fewer data points. So la much much less overhead. So in that way. We hope we can give you still give you accurate estimates without incurring a lot of overhead. So this is going to be uh, experimented next. The second is, uh, um, as you see here, is uh, that's a lot of uh, automation, uh, a lot of manual process. We grab something from Kepler, we calculate something um, uh, inside of the uh, demo scripts. Hopefully, in the next demo, in a future work. We can automate the whole thing. So, when the system is running, we can automatically get the capital metrics, and that's where matching up the uh, bucket activities. Hopefully, that's where give it an uh, overall uh, visualization at the end without have to wait, um, you know, from in a batch manner. There's lots of things can be optimized. Tracing so uh, is definitely something we can reduce, and then we can also visualize the how much energy used by overhead in the system. For example, the uh, the self checker. If you can use it in the same method to identify some other things in your software stack, that's going to be great. And eventually, I think more or less in the future, we are going to have some carbon-oriented policy, carbon limiting, similar to risk limiting. Carbon neutral, similar to you know performance or QoS, things like that. So people we are using their service in a responsible way and in a sustainable way, without having to worry about what they were over budgeting their carbon credits or over consume their you know their budgeted power and uh, carbon. So hopefully that is something we can also support in the future. Um, that's end our presentation, and we are open to questions. Yes, I think uh, the protocol is you have to move over there. The speaker over there, then we can. What you can do? I was wondering if you can correlate or add correlation to uh, other resource consumption, like networking, for instance, and also how much does it itself consume? Like, can you f actually figure out how, EB how much energy EBPF consumes? Uh, thank you. That's a very good question. So the idea is, uh, uh, the question is uh, how much energy we can, uh, uh, how much uh, overhead and how much energy we can measure. Uh, so let's just go to one, one thing at a time. So in EBPF, the overhead is low, is very low. But when I say low, that is very subjective. We do identify certain things we can optimize. Uh, but in all in uh, transparency, when we run capital, we see capital only use 2% of the CPU. And that can be optimized as well, because most of the capital overhead comes from Prometheus. We can use you know, more uh, efficient Prometheus clients API in the future. The other thing we do not uh, measure is the EBPF itself, how much overhead in EBPF itself. So the nice thing with that is the uh, Linux kernel keeps progressing. It's supporting more uh, advanced usage of uh, EBPF. So with that, we, right now it's small. We can opt still optimize in the future. Um, so the system itself, uh, when we collect information and do the correlation, that obviously puts a lot of pressure on the Prometheus. And hopefully, we can have more efficient uh, aggreg uh, aggregation that so Prometheus can support or any other analytic system can support. So we do not have to use a lot of aggregation uh, calculation in the future. Uh, 